Good day, folks. This is Greg Judy Green Pastures Farm. Today it's a cold, blustery day in January, and got the chores done. And um, Jan had a list of questions from uh, you subscribers that she's been keeping track of and written down. And so, uh, Jan, I was going to have you go ahead and fire fire me some questions, and we'll do some discussion. Okay. Well, um, yeah. Uh, Happy New Year to all of you, and uh, welcome back. <laughs> Uh, I'm not feeling the best, so I'm going to stay out of the picture, just so you don't get any germs. <laughs> um, so, uh, this is on when Greg explained on how to start your own grazing farm. That was the title. Okay, question was, and some of these are lengthy, I just copied and pasted them. Do you have any suggestions on how to purchase guardian dogs, considering that you need them to work right away, um, that they would need to be trained, ready, or is there any drawbacks from you being unfamiliar with them or having to attempt to raise them on your own? Um, so I guess basically, what are your thoughts on <laughs> guard dogs? So uh, puppies, trained dogs, what? Yeah, so if you're starting out with, you know, sheep or goat, <coughs> sheep or goats, um, you need to have some kind of protection. And if you don't, uh, all you've got is... A wreck. Yeah, a wreck. Coyote feed, I call it. Um, and so it's tough to get that first guard dog that's trained. They're hard to find, you know, good trained dogs, but... Well, they're and they're expensive. They are, but, you know, let's talk about expense. Um, you know, we had a friend that lost 350 sheep in one night. True. How expensive would a good guard dog have been? You know, his parting words to me was he had llamas... He had eight llamas in with the sheep, and he's like, Greg, you know how much guard dog feed I could have bought um, to make up for 350 dead sheep? That was in one night. So, yeah, a guard dog is not expensive, not when it comes to... <laughs> if you're going to be in the business, you know, you got to protect them. So get you one that is bonded onto the sheep that's raised with livestock. Um, don't go to somebody that's just raising dogs, a uh, kennel. Those dogs are not going to have a clue. They, they, they haven't been raised around livestock. They're probably going to be predators. They might actually kill your sheep or goats. So buy your livestock dog from somebody that's raising sheep or goats. Okay, but so on to the next step. What if you can't find a trained dog and you can only find puppies? What are your ideas on that? Yeah, so when you talk about puppies, you know, um, a six-month-old dog can bark. And I can remember we lost both of our guardian dogs. Rue got killed like on a Saturday. She was a Pyrenees. She got hit by a car. And Junior got hit like seven days later. They both got killed within a week. And we had about 300 head of sheep at that time. And I didn't have any guard dogs. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I, luckily I got a hold of a producer that had this uh, female she was only six months old, but she was a Merima cross, the same cross as we use today, half Merima, a quarter Anatolian, and a quarter Pyrenees. And I dumped that dog out in the flock. Now, they were on a small area, probably three acres, and that dog had been raised with sheep, and she ran out there and started barking and got him in a circle. And I came up that night at about 10 o'clock to see what would happen, and she started barking at me on the road. I was sitting in my truck, and... She was flying around them sheep. And um, so once I got her, then it wasn't too long. You know, we found another young one to put with her. Always try and keep two dogs. I don't care if you have 20 sheep. I, I would keep two dogs. And that's just because they work better together. Um, don't start out with two puppies, though. I think that's asking for a wreck. Because you get two puppies. Uh, you and I have discussed this, Jan. It's like two teenagers. Yep, yep. Like, I know where the car keys are. You know where the liquor cabinet is. <laughs> Let's go have some fun. Yeah, and fun to a pair of guard dog puppies is chasing and harassing sheep. Because they run. They, they chase them. And, you know, that energy. It's energy. It's just, it starts out being fun, but it can really turn into a deadly game quickly. And that is two, you know, three or four month old pups, but more like four to five months old. But they can get a sheep down, a young one. And they start chewing on it, you know, playing with it. Right. And then they get a little blood showing on the ear. And then they had a chewed off tail. Next thing you know, you find a half-eaten lamb. Now you're you're done. You're just done. I mean, that's a tough deal. But um, don't let that happen. Well, and one of the ways we 
how do we like to introduce um, dogs, pups to our flock? Because that's an, that's an important thing. People a lot of times will just think, oh, they're, they've been with livestock and they just want to dump them out there. No. So if you, if you have an older dog already in the flock and you dump a, just a weaned puppy, let's say it's a, a couple weeks weaned, it's eight to 10 weeks old, and you take that puppy out to your flock and you dump it in there with that older dog, um, that older dog is probably gonna whip that puppy pretty good. Might even whip him enough that the puppy just goes, ar, 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 and takes off running. You don't see that puppy again, it's gone. Uh, and you may do that after you leave and you come back and the pup's just gone. And so you need to put it in netting, that's what we do. We put them, and we have a movable cage. Uh, now we can move it out in the paddock with the sheep. And all it is is cattle panels on runners, they've got a feeder in there and a tarp over it so when it rains hard, they don't get pounded with rain. And we'll leave them in there, you know, a couple of weeks, but the older dog can sniff that puppy. He can't whip him because he can't get to him. But that puppy's learning what the sheep are all about. The older dogs, they sniff noses and then turn the puppy out. And then you're, 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 good, and, you're good and going from yeah, that point. We, we can't even do that with older dogs, too. Just yeah. to get them used to the sheep, us, the area. Yep. Because um, you spend, you spend some money on these things. So if, let's say you buy the whole sheep kit. You've got your ewes, you've got your rams. Um, let's say... <coughs> <coughs> with the rams, you don't want to be turning them in just any old time um, because uh, you'll be lambing in, you know, in, all, in the off season, which can be a real wreck. So, well, you know, don't do that, but bring them home, put them in netting, but don't put the dog in with the sheep. Put the dog in its own little container where it can smell the sheep. And we only do that for like a day. And then the dog knows about the sheep, the sheep knows about the dog. You can let them have access to each other within that netting. And in a couple of days, let them out. And you're good to go after that. But that first experience, uh, we sold a bunch of sheep to a fellow and it was a strange dog that went into those sheep. And it was so happy to get out of his hutch when we got to the farm and it started running in a circle, just chasing his tail almost. Well, when it was running that circle, it was also running sheep. And those ewes almost blew through that netting. And I would never do that again. <laughs> Make sure that dog doesn't go out there and just get all excited and run your sheep through the netting. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, I think that's an important thing to talk about, um, about the dogs. Yeah. Um, and, and right now we don't have dogs, but we have producers that we can recommend with dogs. Yep. So... With puppies. With puppies, I'm sorry. Yeah. And some of them do have older dogs, like nine-month-old puppies, or they're almost adult dogs that have been yep. trained. So um, we do have access to that. Um, do you have a video explaining your strategy on management, managing invasive weeds, thistles, and anything the cows don't graze in your pasture? <laughs> yeah. So... Our, all, is all this stuff weeds in our pastures when the cows won't eat it? Well, if you're only in the cow business, yeah, it is a weed and it can be a pest and it can get thicker. And I understand the frustration with that. Um, I used to hate ironweed. I mean, I hated it. It would take over our pastures every year from about the end of June, July and August, just the whole pasture turned to ironweed. And uh, cows wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Well, enter sheep. <laughs> uh, sheep devour it they absolutely devour it they eat every leaf as high as they can reach and so all of a sudden what used to be a nuisance plant ironweed is now a advantage plant advan it's advantageous because we've got something to eat it and at this time as they're eating it they've also got lambs sucking on that were born in May and so these lambs are actually being raised on ironweed which is I think that's a pretty cool thing. We took something that was worthless and we turned it into money. Well, is it? Is it? It's not worthless. I said it. It was right. But um, so let's talk about that iron weed. Why was it there? Well, typically in Missouri, I mean, especially in central Missouri, there's going to be some iron weed, and it is the, where we had our worst infestation was in a part of the property 
that uh, you and I took it over. It was on the lifetime lease there on that back 40. Um, it was all pretty much pretty brushy. We got the brush cleaned out of it. Um, we probably got some excessive pugging back there. That's when we used to custom graze these big cows. And so we, when we punched the soil open with the hooves, guess what came up? Ironweed. And it's been there ever since. But now, uh, I don't mind it being back there because I've got something to lead it. It's, right. it's forage to me. Well, and, and that's a, a perennial. Oh, yeah. It comes back every year. And that root, talk about that root. What's that root doing? Well, the, the root on ironweeds, uh, it's a beast. It's breaking the hard pan. It's, it's mining minerals uh, deep in the soil profile that grasses can't reach. And it's bringing it up on those leaves, which is being harvested by the sheep. And then they poop that out on top of the land. So they're basically, it's a, it's a mineral pump. Right, right. Yeah. I think that's pretty cool. Okay. Um, uh, thanks for sharing all your experiences and encouraging people to start their business in a good way of setting up. I have a question, if I may. You said that in the business of solar energy, I don't get that what's the relationship between, I don't get what the, what the relationship is between grazing and solar energy? Good question. So when we talk about being solar energy collectors, what we're talking about is, um, let's just say this is a blade of grass, this pin, okay? That's the length of the grass. And so the light above our head is the sun. So it's like a solar panel. It's collecting energy that that blade of grass is. And that's what's growing it is sunlight. And of course you gotta have rain or you know, moisture. The animals come along and take their tongue and rip the top of that grass blade off. If you leave them there you know, too long, they'll take the whole blade. Well, when you do that, you're reducing the effectiveness of your solar panel. You wanna leave at least 50% of that solar panel intact, let the animals harvest the tops and then keep moving. So when we say solar energy collector, that's what we're talking about. The grass plant, grabs sunlight, it converts it into grass, leaf. The animal, a ruminant, which is a sheep, a pig, I'm sorry, a pig, a sheep or a goat or a cow, they can take this and rip that off and eat it and convert it to a valuable protein. You and I can't do that. We can eat that till we fall over dead. We're not gonna convert that to a valuable protein, like a ruminant. That's because they've got multi-stomachs that can break that down. Okay. Okay, we ready for one more or are I we about ready to? I think we need to end it. Okay. Yeah, I've got a call here I need to make. <laughs> okay. Well, we have lots more questions. Yeah, we'll do another series. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jan, for taking time to do that with us. And uh, folks, uh, y'all be careful and safe out there. And uh, we'll see y'all down the road. Thank you all.